All right, so we're talking about synchronization with a carrier waveform in terms of accurately tracking its phase. That's what we call a coherent reference. And what we're going to look at is what we call a phase lock loop. So this block diagram right here is a way of taking some input signal with an unknown phase theta and then generating a coherent reference. So the output has the exact same frequency, but its phase theta hat very closely tracks the theta of the input. This phase lock loop consists of just a few pieces. There's a low pass filter here. There's what we call a VCO, a voltage controlled oscillator. So what a VCO is, well, the words tell you what it is. It's a voltage controlled oscillator. So depending on the input signal, the phase of the output waveform changes. So as V of T changes, theta hat here on the output will go up and down. If we can get what we call a locked loop, then the input here V of T is zero and the output reference just stays constant. Its phase isn't changing and that will happen when theta hat perfectly matches theta. When the output theta hat does not match the input, what we'll see here is this signal is either positive or negative. And if it's positive, that basically tells the voltage control oscillator, adjust your phase to reduce the error. And if it's negative, it tells the VCO to adjust its phase the other direction to adjust the error to minimize the difference between theta and theta hat. So let's go ahead and walk through this block diagram and write down the math so we can understand what the input to the VCO is. So I'm going to start here with this input. We have this E of T error signal that gets filtered. Let's walk through these different pieces in this PLL analysis. All right, so what is the output of the VCO? On the previous chart, we saw that the output was root two beta cosine omega t plus theta. So omega is the frequency it's fixed and theta hat is the phase of the VCO that's currently being generated. The output of the VCO comes around that kind of bottom feedback loop and it goes through a 90 degree phase shifter. So if we take root 2 beta cosine omega t plus theta and shift it 90 degrees, that changes the argument of the cosine by plus pi over 2. So at the output of the 90 degree phase shifter, this is the signal that we have. And then if I use a little trig identity, we can easily write that instead of cosine shifted by pi over 2, that's really the negative of sine, but take off the pi over 2. So that's just a trig identity right there. The output of the phase shifter was mixed then with what was coming in. What was coming in was the coherent reference that we don't know the theta. So if we multiply this by the input, that was the output of that mixture is what we call the E of T. So E of T was equal to the product of the input, root 2a, cosine omega t plus theta times this quantity right here, a negative root 2 beta sine omega t. So that is the form of E of t. And then let's just simplify that just a little. Root 2 times root 2 is 2. I can bring the a and the beta out front, and then I have a cosine times a sine. And there's obviously a negative sign there as well. So let's use a trig identity right here on this piece. That's cosine alpha times sine of beta. That's what it looks like, right? The product of a cosine times a sine, which is one half sine of the sum of the angles minus sine of the difference of the angles. So if we apply that here, I still have a minus a beta out front, but the one half and the two canceled. And then I'm going to end up with sine of the sum. So I'm going to have this plus this. So that'll be 2 omega t plus theta plus theta hat. And then I'm going to subtract off sine of this minus this. The omega t is cancel. And I'm left with theta minus theta hat. So that's what I end up with. So note this right here is a high frequency term, right? It's at twice the initial frequency. Also note that once I multiply this times this, I now have a positive A beta sine of the difference. This is the quantity that goes into the low pass filter. Remember that E of T goes into the low pass filter. So the low pass filter is going to take out that high frequency component.
So after the low-pass filter, what we have at the output is what we call V of t. The high-frequency component is gone, and all I'm left with is A beta sine of the difference between theta and theta hat. So this was the signal that was input to our VCO. So V of t is the input to the VCO. And now let's think about how this VCO works. Conceptually, what it does is it adjusts its output phase theta hat as a function of the input. Exactly how it does that is really, you know, kind of a controls problem. I mean, yeah, how has this changed? Does this system actually change that theta hat? We should talk about rise times and response times and overshoots. We could go down to that level, but we're not going to go down to that level here. We're just going to kind of talk about kind of top level behavior. As an example, if theta hat perfectly matches theta, then their difference is zero. And then if that difference is zero, sine of zero is zero, which means the V of T is zero. And all VCOs work in a way such that if the input to the VCO is zero, it is not going to change the output at all. The output's going to stay the same because that's what we want to have happen. If this is zero, that means our theta hat perfectly matches theta. We're locked on, we're generating a reference that has the desired phase, so we don't want to change or do anything. So that's what we're gonna do, we're not gonna do anything. On the other hand, if theta minus theta hat is bigger than zero, then sine of a quantity larger than zero is a positive number. Assuming these are positive numbers are well, as well, then the input to the VCO is going to be a number larger than zero, which is gonna tell uh, the VCO, you need to do an adjustment. You need to actually increase theta hat so you can make this get smaller. So when the input to the VCO is positive, we're actually gonna start increasing theta hat to get closer to a match of theta to make this difference get smaller. And that's what we want, right? We're trying to track theta with theta hat. So if it's positive, I need to increase theta hat. All right, what about the other version, the other direction? What if theta minus theta hat is less than zero? Well, if this is a negative number, then sine of a negative number is negative, meaning this whole product is negative, and the input V of t is a negative number. Well, that input voltage being negative means the VCO needs to decrease theta hat. It needs to decrease theta hat, bring it down again to minimize the magnitude of that difference. So this is the behavior that we want our VCO to have, exactly how it does that, how quickly it responds, what its overshoot is, you know, what kind of the control theory aspect is, we're not going to get into here, but this is the general behavior that a VCO is going to have. So what we've seen is that that block diagram that we just analyzed works great. If the output is perfectly matched to the input, then by the time we come back around, the input to the VCO is zero and we don't do anything. If the output of our phase lock loop doesn't match, either because this difference is greater than zero or the difference is less than zero, then the input to the VCO is such that the VCO will be commanded to adjust to make the error get smaller. So this behavior is exactly what we want to have happen. And it's why we call it a phase lock loop. Our VCO is gonna be constantly adjusting to track the input phase and to lock onto that input phase. What we did just now was, you know, working through the math for what we call an unmodulated sinusoid, right? The initial input was just this fixed sinusoid whose amplitude was the same for forever. Well, that's usually not what we have in a digital communication scheme. Usually in a digital communication scheme, we have an input whose frequency is fixed and whose phase is some unknown phase, but possibly whose amplitude is toggling randomly between say plus ones and minus ones. So what happens if we do have an amplitude modulated signal at the input? You know, what if it's modulated? Then this approach isn't going to work and we're gonna need something else, something we call a squaring loop. So in the next video, what we'll look at is what we call a squaring loop. It does something very similar but this squaring loop, which is something you could use for say a BPSK modulated waveform, is um, what we'll use to lock onto the phase of a modulated waveform. So check that out in the next video.